One of the recurring themes early in the show has been the opposition to outsiders, especially urbanites and northerners. Dr. Crower and Gail Emery have found themselves ruffling feathers, even though Gail is a native daughter. Strong Arm of the Law takes that tension between North and South to the nth degree, and it's another episode where the viewer winds up rooting for Lucas. The episode begins, as do many early episodes, with Caleb and Boone snooping where they're not supposed to be. In this case, they're peeping through the windows of the new borders. Caleb witnesses a bunch of men in pig masks drowning another man in a tub, but he gets frightened off when they look out the window. Hey, isn't that something that you'd want to draw the shades for? At breakfast, Barrett, the seeming leader of the men, laments that kids these days are too glued to the idiot box and can't make up stories the way that they used to. The men are from Flint, Michigan, and they're in the service sector, according to Barrett. Caleb regards them suspiciously as Dr. Matt heads out. Fans of sound design will either appreciate or hate this scene. As the camera swirls around the table, we're subjected to a cacophony of slurping mouth sounds and silverware scraping on the flatware. The overall sense you get is of gluttony, bad manners, and general obnoxiousness. I'll talk to Caleb. Yeah, service. Me too. I'm a waitress. You know, I hear things are really opening up down here. In what way? I don't care what you call me. They smell damn good to me. The body of Will Hawkins is found in the tub. Dr. Matt rules it an accidental drowning, possibly precipitated by a heart attack. But when he finds out that Lucas is fine with that, he promises to take another look. Deputy Ben notes that Will Hawkins became accident prone the moment that he backed Lucas's opposition in the most recent election. Barrett and friends have been shaking people down in Trinity under the guise of false charities. I mean, if it's not the government and the welfare cheats, it's the charity racket. Deputy Ben runs afoul of the boys and catches a beat down for his troubles. Old coot Cecil Perkins comes to Dr. Matt for a black eye and some other internal injuries. And when Sheriff Buck arrives on the scene asking for an ID, Cecil goes off on him. I mean, that is the bargain we made, isn't it? I mean, the end justifies the means, a little corruption is tolerated as long as the trains run on time. Laying out that Trinity is indeed a fascist microcosm. Even Matt remarks that Lucas is looking weak and ineffectual. A ruffled Ben complains that Lucas hasn't arrested them and accuses him of hiring them to shake things up in Trinity in the first place. Lucas angrily complains about Ben's fickleness and, by proxy, the fickle nature of the citizens of Trinity. This is a highly entertaining scene for Cole and Circe, but Lucas fallaciously argues a false dichotomy here. Probably intentionally so, given who he is and that he's a politician. A false dichotomy is one that limits the available choices to force a bad choice or make the chooser look unreasonable. Buck wields it here to manipulate Deputy Ben, who, of course, backs off. Buck shows up as the boys are chilling out on the porch and offers a deal. Come to work for him and he'll lay off. Caleb wants an explanation, but Buck is standoffish. So Caleb sneaks into Barrett's room and rifles through his stolen things. Barrett and his brothers come at the most inconvenient time, planning their escape from Trinity after a few more shakedowns. That night, Caleb gets a visit from the pigmen. He calls for Merle, but when she doesn't appear, he summons a supernatural roar that frightens off the gang. <laughs> Caleb is shocked at what he just did and thanks Merle, but it's pretty clear he didn't get it from her side of the family. Just Eddie gets drunk and hooks up with a local girl, so Lucas offers him more liquor and describes what happens when you get the electric chair. Eddie says he gets claustrophobic, which can't be a good sign. Open up the door. I, I can't be cooped up. I'm claustrophobic. I'm sure those were old Will Hawkins' thoughts as he was held under in his tub. You say I did. Well, you just did, dummy. He wakes up from his drunken stupor in the coffin buried alive with the corpse of Will Hawkins. Gail sends Caleb to her place for safety and tells Earl that she's in on it with Lucas, trying to get some information. It backfires, though, as he attacks her, but Lucas is there to make the save for the second episode in a row. Evil Lynn manuel Miranda shows up to post bail for just Eddie and Earl, but Lucas says that they escaped after he takes Lowell's money. Buck tells him that there's nothing he can do about it, so they better just get out of town. Lowell lunges at him, which Lucas says is a felony, so Lowell winds up in jail, being strangled by his own belt. Help, Ben. Help. There's a man trying to commit suicide in our jail. This is a hilariously perverse scene for Lucas. Lowell survives, but Buck offers them a deal. Return all the money and become tire salesmen, or get the hell out of town. He advises them to head north, so of course they head south, 
where Lucas and Ben are waiting with a roadblock. Park across both lanes. We'll be in the middle of the road. That's why they call it a roadblock, man. Lola and Barrett flip their car, and Lucas cuffs them to the car with a flare in the gas tank. Ellis. Ben is still having a crisis of conscience, so Buck brings up how he was assaulted. Your conscience still bothering you? Yes, it is. Well, tell me, Ben, what hurts more, your conscience or your rib cage? And Ben gets in the car, making one more deal with the devil. Strong Armor of the Law is a filler episode, but one that does a lot of heavy lifting in explaining how Lucas Buck works with the town of Trinity. Not everyone is a fan of Buck, clearly. And even those who do count themselves as his allies do so because they need something from him. A gang of Yankees throwing a wrench into that deal just won't do. If we take Potato Boy out of the equation, as it never aired in order, the last three episodes all have underlying themes of Sheriff Buck responding to challenges to his authority. First it was Wayland Flood having no respect for Ben, then Lieutenant Dre threatening him, and now Barrett and company running roughshod over Trinity. Well, if there's one thing a fascist dictator can't afford to be seen as, it's weak. Maybe I should check you, Sheriff. Have a look at that Achilles heel of yours. So we see how he creatively maneuvers all the pieces on the board to maintain his image. And it works. Ben returns to the fold as he hates the men who assaulted him more than he hates Lucas. And Lucas took the bad men away. That's why fascist societies can exist. People hate them, but they like the individual benefit for themselves. How much you enjoy this episode depends on how much you buy into the gang of Michigan street toughs. For me, they seem horribly out of place in the show. Like it was a mandate from the network that we get some light Tarantino ripoffs. It's not to say that the performances are bad, it's just that Trinity is such a deep-rooted little 1950s town, seeing it pulled into the 1990s seems almost anachronistic. They did set up good foils for Lucas, the smart aleck Yankees coming into the sleepy southern town and thinking they'll just outsmart everyone. And the result feels like one of the most Tales from the Cryptian episodes yet. <laughs>